Um, all right, good evening, everybody. Uh, delighted to uh, welcome you uh, to uh, Miami Business School this evening. Doing something a little bit different this evening, uh, instead of the usual CEO routine with uh, television advertisements and uh, songs and dances and so forth, uh, we've got the, uh, the more serious side of corporate America tonight. Uh, so Ron Williams is one of the most important and uh, esteemed and experienced uh, non-executive directors in the United States. Um, he was the CEO of Aetna uh, and so knows all things that you need to know about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that was from uh, the time when it was being thought about and initially promulgated, not today. Uh, but today he uh, transformed from uh, being in corporate leadership as CEO uh, to a career in governance and uh, today is on the boards of American Express, uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Boeing and uh, has been on the boards of many other companies as well. And uh, he's a uh, very uh, proud alumnus of the uh, Sloan School of Management at MIT. So Ron, we're, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, it's very kind of you to share your thoughts. Uh, I think you have a few um, slides or uh, PowerPoint that you're going to present and then we'll have a Q&A after that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Um, you know, regarding the ACA, I have to say I'm very pleased. I actually have a signed copy of the act that is signed by the president, which he presented to me uh, in appreciation for my efforts to get the bill passed. So, uh, very proud of that. Uh, I want to start out, and this is um, the presentation I put together, to really kind of chalk the field in the context of what I'm going to present and hopefully stimulate questions uh, as we get into the Q&A part of this. Um, I think the thing I'm going to start out with is, is sharing my, a little bit about my background, my perspective. I've served in a wide variety of roles. I've been a chairman and a CEO, a board member, a committee member, and, and now lead director at American Express. I also have had a substantial amount of board experience. I stopped counting somewhere around 12. Uh, boards, and um, these are large uh, corporate boards. Uh, I also have served in my private equity work, which I do now, uh, on um, private equity boards where we buy companies. I like to say we buy good companies and we make them better, and then we turn them over to others who will go on to the next phase, and then a good amount of uh, nonprofit. And I think nonprofit is uh, very important because that's a place many people get their start, and maybe we'll talk about that. These are some of the committees uh, that boards typically have. I have been on each and every one of these committees uh, during my board tenure. And um, one of the things I like to talk about is, and we'll get into more detail, is what is the CEO's job? And I think one of the fundamental things the CEO is responsible to is to look after stakeholders, broadly speaking, and also shareholders. And this represents performance during the time I was at Aetna. We had, at the beginning, a lot of unhappy shareholders. At the end, we had a few happy shareholders. But one of the things that gets missed is that the CEO's job is to build a company. It's to build a team. And a good CEO produces this kind of result. And then when they leave, the company goes on and continues to have very significant financial success. And so if you think about that role, that's a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, this I will not uh, attribute to causation. It may be correlation, I'm not sure. Uh, this is uh, slides on the dates when I started with uh, the three major boards I'm on and the, the changes in their share price uh, up to the current. So um, it's been a nice run so far. But the one thing you know is there will be changes. Um, this slide really gives you a sense of what it is that the criteria that directors have. And I can tell you that integrity is really one of the most absolutely critical things that people look for. People need to know that you are there to represent the shareholders, 
that some of the tough decisions I'll share with you later are decisions that are going to be made in the best interests of the shareholders. That's reflected in your reputation, in your brand, and quite honestly, one of the challenges of getting on boards is board members want to know who they're in the foxhole with. They want to know that when they look to their left and they look to the right, there's somebody there that they can really count on to stand up and make very difficult decisions. Accomplished people and often C-suite executives or subject matter experts in particular domains. And it's also important that board members really be independent and not a captive of management or a captive of the CEO or a particular sub-element. They're there to represent the shareholders, broadly speaking. Now, uh, this um, little bit on the history of uh, corporate, corporate boards, which is, in the old days, boards were really uh, like going to the country club. They played golf, they went on long junkets, they you know, had wine at every meal. I mean, it was really fun. I wasn't around during those days. <laughs> I miss that. So then boards got into this period of compliance. So it was all about checking the boxes, making certain that the board was, that the company was behaving the appropriate way. That's important. But in addition to that, boards are much more engaged with the long-term strategy of the business in creating success today. It is real work. When I chaired the American Express Audit Committee, it was not unusual to get a 300-page audit book. That was in addition to the risk committee book, which might also be quite substantial. So, and I, I had a standard that if I ever got in court, I wanted to be able to say, I read every page and I understood it to the best of my ability and what I didn't understand, I asked questions about. So understand that when you have interest in the, these areas, you're taking on very, very serious obligations. Now, an effective board, um, size is one of the things that is often debated. Typically boards are kind of nine to 12 people. They may go up a little bit if people are about to retire and they want to bring people in and get them oriented. We'll talk later maybe about boardroom dynamics and the dynamic between the CEO and the board, if they're the chairman or not the chairman, and board processes. Now, one of the questions we have a lot of debate about now is who leads the board? Is it the CEO, who is also the chairman, in which case there's a lead director? Or is there an executive chairman who often is someone who was the CEO who is now the chairman? Often that is transitional, and maybe we'll talk about why a little bit later. And then there's often an independent chairman where the, C chair the CEO is just the CEO and the chairman chairs the company. Those are three uh, models. Now, boards have really difficult decisions to make. And often there are three possible outcomes for decisions that boards make. The first outcome is very, very bad. And the board has to debate that, they have to come to grips with it, and they have to be prepared that it's about the board and the company, it's not about them personally. Now the second outcome on the decision is terrible. It is absolutely horrific. Something's blown up somewhere. Oil's leaked into the Gulf. <laughs> I mean, really substantial and significant things have happened. I think you know where this is going, which means the last decision is absolutely horrific. It's something that no woman want to have happen. And I come to mind, it was a company that was doing something in Africa, in India, I think, and a gas methane cloud bubble came up and literally killed thousands of people in the community. And that company had to grapple with that issue and decide what the right thing to do was. So these are some of the challenges. I won't go through all of them, but these are all real, <laughs> okay? These are all things I've been involved in, um, one of which was going to Wall Street and saying, you've got a going concern, you've been in business 100 years, and we have no idea how much money we're gonna make. We are withdrawing guidance. We're not telling, we're not saying what we're gonna earn because we don't know. Some of the others, litigation, um, healthcare, we had substantial legislation that transformed the industry. And probably one of the ones I um, uh, was most interesting was I joined the board of Lucent Technologies. One year, Lucent had revenues of $40 billion. Two years later, they had revenues of $8 billion. They had telephones, offices, computers, 
all of the people had disappeared. This was during the dot-com meltdown when they had grown enormously and all of a sudden the whole industry collapsed and the board had to govern and oversee untangling that for the company. So I'm gonna jump over this in the interest of time. We'll get to this a little bit later, but these are just a few of the types of things that you deal with. Now, what does the board do? And it's very important to understand that the board does not manage. The board oversees. And there are a few rules you'll hear talked about, noses in, fingers out. That boards have unlimited access to get information, but really should not give work direction other than through the CEO of the company or through, in, the, in some instances, internal audit or through outside advisors that they may return. This gives you a sense of one of the most critical things they do, which we'll talk about, is really the CEO, is hiring and firing the CEO. These are uh, a, a few of the things the board's involved in. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the shareholder base because if you set the clock back far enough, stocks were really a retail phenomenon. Individual investors went down, bought a stock, and the shareholder base was really Main Street America. If you look at the composition of this base, what you see is it's mostly institutions. Now those institutions represent mutual funds, pension funds, retirement funds, 401ks. But the whole process of really participating in the governance of these companies is an institutional activity today. It's not a retail activity. And that's a very important difference to understand. And it, it, it also represents a very different pressure point for companies, which we'll get to maybe when we get to the activist point. Now, one of the things boards deal with as a critical priority is hire, fire, and replace the CEO. And this is one of the central things that the board does. Now, it's complicated by the fact that most boards actually have an incomplete understanding of what the CEO does and what it takes to actually run that company because management lives with it 24 seven, seven days a week, all the time. And the board shows up six, eight times a year, a day, day and a half, or two days. But this is their job. Now, um, one of the things and one of the reasons that boards like to have CEOs on it is because CEOs understand what CEOs have to do. And this slide gives you a sense of some of the things that the CEO has to really understand. One of them is to provide leadership and coaching to the board because the CEO has to make accessible to the board critical issues that the board has to make decisions on. And the CEO, because of their immersion in the business and the competitive environment, is in a position to really articulate that. They have to obviously deliver results, and the other thing which is really critical on here is the chief talent officer. And that's not to denigrate the chief human resource officer, it's to recognize that there are two kinds of capital companies have, really three times, intellectual, financial, and human. And companies win with human capital. That is one of the single most important things. And for the students in the room, I would tell you that the students worry about where am I gonna find a job, you know, how am I gonna get established, the company's on the other end of that equation. Where am I gonna find the people who are committed, who are focused, who are energetic, and passionate about winning? And so this whole issue of human capital is really um, extremely. The other thing which is really important is that CEOs have the greatest degree of freedom in a company, meaning when they discover that trends have changed, it is the CEO who can really pick the company up and move it someplace else. No one else can in that organization. So it's a critical role and directors really need to understand what the CEO does. Now, I can tell you from the time I spend with CEOs and last year I coached about 164 C-suite executives, many of them are our CEOs, and one of the best days in their life is the day they become a CEO. And when I talk to them, I tell them, I always ask them first, do you have a pet? And many of them say yes and some say no. And I say, if you don't have a pet, please get one. And they say, why? And I tell them that as a CEO, the day will come where your wife, your kids, your employees, your board will all be mad as hell at you. 
and the only person who's going to love you is that pet. <laughs> so get one. This is the good news, and this is the bad news. This is walking the plank. <laughs> this is when the board has said, we love you, but it's not working. And it may not even be related to your financial performance. One of your subordinates may have done something crazy. There may have been a, a factory that explodes. A politician may get a burr under their saddle and just can't stand you and tells the company, they, they, they go or else you're gonna be investigated for eternity. So as a CEO, you have to understand there's a time to come and there's a time to go. And that's one of the tougher parts of it. Now, this slide just gives you a sense of kind of what the turnover has been. This is in the Fortune uh, S&P uh, 500 uh, category. This gives you the distribution of the turnover among the different size of the companies. And this gives you a sense that the average age of exiting is 60. Uh, CEOs last you know, six, seven, eight, a long-running CEO now is over 10 years. I mean, it, it is a very demanding job. And um, people come and people go. There are, uh, you can see here that of the CEOs in this category, a small number of women. Today, there are three African-American CEOs. At one point, there were seven. And uh, there are about 10 uh, Latino uh, CEOs in major companies. Uh, this is another slide on the succession activity, whoever replaces the CEO, where did they come from? Inside the company, outside the company. Now, I can tell you that the companies I've been involved with, we've been through succession in each of those companies. And in each case, there was an internal promotion of someone who over the course of their career had been developed, trained, and competed against others and moved into the CEO chair. One of the fundamental obligations when I mention human capital of the CEO is to replace themselves with an able leader who can continue the growth, profitability, and sustainability of the enterprise. Um, these are just some of the issues that boards are worried about now, kind of key trends. One of them, which everyone's focused on, are all the significant industry trends. If you're in retail, Retail's melting, everything's going online, digital, move to mobile, artificial intelligence, analytics. There's a whole set of things that are disrupting companies, including whole new business models and ways of doing business that require companies to retool what they do. One of the things I often talk to CEOs about is that established companies, by their nature, are built to do yesterday's work. They're not built to do tomorrow's work. And the reality is that that's why nimble younger companies emerge who are unencumbered with the history and baggage and can run to where consumers are going and be unencumbered. Great CEOs figure that out and focus on that and great boards help them identify it, support it, and acquire both the financial and human capital resources. The others are pretty straightforward. Cyber is everywhere. Um, you know, you think about important trends, and, and I, the um, slide I had about walking the plank. Target, the Target CEO was fired over cybersecurity, in my opinion. Now, today, the number of companies that have the same kind of cyber breach, there's probably one a day. <laughs> And this was an example where being first was not an advantage to the target CEO. <laughs> now, he should have run the company better, and they shouldn't have had that vulnerability. But cyber is really an extremely important area, and then competition for talent. Uh, these are just some other uh, things that boards are worried about. And I want to take a minute and talk about risk. This is one of the critical things that the board does, which is to try to figure out what is the risk appetite of the enterprise. And by risk appetite, is the company undertaking activities that have an ability to end the franchise? Now, we think about a lot of those as financial, but culture is one of the most critical elements. Is the company creating and sustaining a culture that is value-based and that leads to high performance? And I can tell you, whenever you see companies in the headlines, 
for doing something when you say to yourself, why on earth did they do that? It was a company where the CEO and the board failed to infuse deeply in that company a culture in which somebody in that room said, that's not who we are. We don't do that. And that is a failure to infuse that level of culture, and that leads back to risk and the risk appetite. These are just a few of the things that other things the board's worried about. Strategy is also a critical domain of the board, not to make the strategy, but to support management and understanding it, to understand the strategic options, to understand the risk associated with it, and to understand the financial capital and human uh, activity, and then succession planning. This gives you um, a sense in, of, of the proxy process. Now, the proxy process has annual shareholder meeting and people come and put proposals on the, in essence, on the ballot. And a lot of the proposals relate to the governance domain. What does it take for shareholders to call a special meeting? What does it take to get on, on the ballot? The activists are very prominent in this area, but there also are a variety of special interest groups who have a variety of proposals that they put on. And this slide just gives you a sense of what some of them are. Environmental is one. One of the areas that's very active is political and lobbying, where people put proposals on that says to the company, we want you to list who you are giving money to for political and lobbying activity. And companies typically are very hesitant to do that. They often contribute to uh, associations or industry trade groups who then go out and lobby and support things as opposed to doing it themselves. But uh, that's uh, an area. Now, I want to spend a few minutes in closing on activists. Activists basically, um, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. And you probably read about them in the newspapers coming after this company or going after that company. What they try to do is they try to find a company that they believe is undervalued or undermanaged. And then they go around to the institutional shareholders and basically say, if you support us, we will run an alternative slate of directors and we will bring in new management and we will turn this company around and create more value. Often it'll go all the way down to an election or there's a negotiation and some kind of settlement and one or two directors joins the board. Um, there are many instances where they do add value in other instances, it may or may not work out, but you have to judge them each individually. For management and the board, it is a huge diversion and I think one of the things companies do and boards are now doing is basically functioning as their own activists and to say, if I were an activist and I came in here, do we have poor performing divisions where we have tolerated that performance? Do we have the right strategy given the changing dynamic in the industry? And so the best defense for a board against activists is really to be an activist uh, uh, yourself. Um, this is a sense of the number of activist campaigns uh, that were held in 2016. There were 456 campaigns against companies that were what I would call significant, and then 302 that were focused on very specific activities where people had a particular belief or a particular uh, point of view. This is globally, by the way. So we're now gonna shift to questions, but I do wanna close with a, uh, just a brazen advertisement for my upcoming book. Uh, <laughs> which is called Learning to Lead. It'll be out in uh, this spring, and it is really about learning to lead yourself, learning to lead others, and learning to lead organizations. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, Ron, wh why don't we just uh, start um, with the brazen advertisement and tell us uh, a few of the kind of key insights in each of those three domains. Yeah, I, I think I would start with learning to lead yourself, and that really is about re reframing, learning to reframe. And by reframe, what I mean is we, we grow up in a certain set of circumstances with a certain set of beliefs. You're a woman, so you can't do this. You're African-American or Latino, you can't go into that field, or you're not good at this, or you're not good at that. Reframing is really about not absorbing what people tell you can do and defining for yourself by trying to demonstrate what you can do. And it sounds very simple, and it is. It is enormously empowering, because what you find is you can learn anything you want to learn if you work at it. 
It may come easier to some or harder to others. The biggest barrier is, is the fact that you haven't reframed who you are and what you can do. So that's a lesson one. I think lesson two in the context of learning to lead others is recognizing that we are all highly goal-oriented and we believe that getting things done is extremely important. One of the things that you have to recognize in a collaborative environment is assume positive intent. That the person who looks at your hairstyle and says, hmm, is that person taking a cheap shot at you or they've never seen that and they really don't know what to say? My experience is if you assume positive intent, it's very easy to sort the jerks out from the non-jerks on the third or fourth comment. But it lubricates the interaction and it's particularly important for new entrants to the workforce, people who come from different backgrounds and don't have a lot of experience. The other thing that's extremely um, important in the uh, second category is as you begin to manage others, you have to understand that no matter how focused you are on achieving the goal, your consideration for getting the goal done has to be less than your consideration for the people doing the work. So if, if you're goal-oriented to here, the answer isn't lower your goal. It's raise your consideration for the people you're working with. And what you'll find is you'll get better results, people will appreciate it, and people will begin to gravitate towards you as a leader. In the third one in learning to lead organizations, I would sum it up in the fact that leading is a responsibility and an obligation. We all think about the perks we get, more money, parking space, a bigger office. Where's the list of obligations we take on? <laughs> Working late, missing events, uh, worrying about the, the, the organization, giving up, making personal trade-offs. So I think, I think thinking about the responsibility and obligation we have would be one of the things that's critical. The final point I would make is that culture trumps strategy every day. If you have the right strategy but a bad culture, you're gonna get nowhere. If you have the right strategy and you build a positive, high-performing culture, it makes an enormous difference. And I'll give you an example. Someone has a goal, their goal is to uh, make 100 widgets. They make 98. So is that person told, get out of here, if you don't make 100 widgets, I'm gonna fire you and get somebody in here. Or do you have a conversation that says, why did you miss? What, what caused you to miss? What can we do to help you do what needs to be done? You need more resource, you need more counseling, you need training, you need skills. Really having a conversation that is based on getting to the goal is really extremely important and what you find is People want to achieve, people want to meet expectations. I meet very few who are interested in demands. Let, let me just uh, ask one more and then we'll open it up. Um, you, you mentioned uh, early on in the comments the value of getting on a nonprofit board as a basis for gaining experience uh, that could lead to a for-profit assignment later on. Uh, can you talk about that and also the contrasts between governance in a non-profit environment and a for-profit environment? Yeah, it's, uh, for me, I'll just use my own uh, situation as an example. My very first board experience was on the YMCA in Los Angeles. And I got on that board because the experiences I'd had with the YMCA as uh, a, a, a young man. And what I learned there was that the executives in the community were really running that organization from major companies. And in going to that, I saw for the first time what an audit committee did. I saw what a finance committee did. And I got exposure and training that helped me reframe what this was all about, develop those relationships, and then one day came and they needed somebody to run the information technology committee. And I was the only person who knew anything about technology. <laughs> having worked at a computer company. And for me, that was helpful. So I think in terms of your career and your aspiration, one, pick something you have a passion in. Two, use it as an opportunity to learn new skills by engaging and being around 
what are more senior executives who bring that skill set into that arena. And as you get to know them, they develop confidence in you and can become mentor and advisors and people who could recommend you for opportunities. So that would be, I think, one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, uh, let's open it up uh, to uh, questions. Um, uh, let's take uh, Jacqueline first, okay? And if you could come down uh, with your microphone to the middle. Yeah, thanks. Well, when I knew him, he was a tremendous executive and a great person uh, as, as well. Uh, I think the, uh, the impact that leaders have is dramatically understated when you have a good leader. I mean, he was a person who kept that company healthy, alive, growing, and repositioned it enormously. And you know, there's an underappreciation. If you think about people who are, who are in the Olympics, you know, the difference between third place and first place is, is literally often seconds. In business, the difference between a really great leader and one who's not so great is, can be a difference between companies being alive and not being alive. And he was the one who made an enormous difference. You know that he was focused on building an institution. Being a leader isn't about only what you do. The leader gets the credit sometimes too much, sometimes too little. The reality is you build a team. It's a collaborative activity. And you're only as good as a talent. And I tell people, hire people who are as good as you or better. <laughs> That's your job. It's not to hire people who are unable to, to rise above where you are. So I, I think you kind of know by ter in terms of how the executive recruits, trains, develops, and mentors, and how that person has an understanding that they're gonna run a leg of the race and then they gotta hand it off to somebody else. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Mr. Williams, for that very Sure. You know, I've been, I'm on, I've been on private boards, I've been on public boards, and every private company CEO wants to be a public company CEO, and I tell them, you have no idea what you're signing up for. <laughs> You've got the best life there is. <laughs> but they never believe me. Um, I'll give you just a simple example. If you're running a private company as we do in private equity, we care about whether or not we will get to the milestone we outlined. We don't really focus on, do we get there on March 29th or April 20th? If you're a public company, the difference between one quarter and another quarter can have outsized impact on your valuation and your credibility as a company. And so there are dramatically different is issues associated with being 
both public but also widely held as you increase the circle of shareholders. So big differences. Uh, gentlemen with the uh, orange shirt, let's try the mics to see if they actually work now. Hold on. Did everyone hear the question? I want to be certain people heard the question. I think you might repeat it wrong. Uh, yeah. The, the, the question was family businesses and the multi generational issues of a business with, I'll say, a certain critical mass and revenue and profit generation, which may be growing, but isn't growing as fast as the number of sons, daughters, granddaughters, grandchildren. And the question of do they want to do what their great grandfather or grandfather did? Is that how they want to spend their life? Uh, first, I would say, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword to have such a platform. And I think one of the things that, uh, and I, let me first say, I'm no expert in this area, okay? I'm first generation, everything I have, I created. <laughs> um, but I would say that, like most things, you, you, it all starts with communication. That there has to be a conversation about what is it that the family wants is about. And is it a realistic expectation that children, grandchildren, et cetera, will want to do what someone two generations wanted to do? Also, there's a whole question about the changing technology. The industry may be under siege. Regulations may change. There's a level of agility that the business has to adopt in order to survive. That agility can be met through professional management. Um, it can be met through sale and monetization of the asset. But there has to be communication and a clear dialogue because time's gonna pass and that other generation is going to go to their reward and then there's gonna be another generation and the last thing you want is a business run by people who don't wanna run it. <laughs> Hopefully that's hopeful. Okay. Um, gentleman in the middle here. Hello? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I get the jackpot. I get a bonus, right? First of all, I'm a graduate of the School of Psychology uh, at UM, and I went to uh, Columbia. And uh, I want to address the more relevant issue. I think it affects everybody here with healthcare. Um, I also want to say that I worked with and for Gary Hamill at MIT. We hire him when I ran Cigna globally, yeah. and I'm a big, big fan of MIT and the Sloan Business School. Nothing, no. nothing to compete with the UM. <laughs> the, how do you feel being with Edna, with the move of Edna, Edna and CVS, that's a big, big merger, and how that is gonna relate to the huge amount of capital coming from Mexico to compete directly with that model. That is happening whether we like it or not. What is your perspective on yeah. that? And, and just to re repeat the, 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 what's going on is that uh, the CEO who replaced me um, has entered into a uh, transaction with CVS Health. Most of you know CVS drugstores. Uh, and they have minute clinics, and CVS is acquiring Aetna for $69 billion. So I'm of two minds. As a shareholder, I think it's terrific. <laughs> 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 uh, 
as a former CEO, there is you know, a, a sadness about the end of a 150-year-old company as a New York Stock Exchange traded company. But it also is a demonstration of many of the points that I made, which is the world's a dynamic place. Healthcare is a critical issue, and we're not creating enough value in the system for people who need it. And CVS has, I think, some interesting ideas because to the extent that they can better link the pharmacy, the data that Aetna has, which Aetna has enormous data. We actually were doing big data before big data was used because we have all your claim data, we have your pharmacy data, we have your personal health record, we have all your diagnostic tests. And so the ability to link all that data and identify early interventions, which, which the patient can either take advantage of or not as they choose, can really improve the overall healthcare system. Yet to be proven, but um, you know, I think again, as a shareholder, I think it's great, hate to see them go, but there's a real problem to be solved and sticking with what you've been doing is not always a winning formulation as the world change. You gotta change with it. Just, just talk uh, a little bit, Ron, about the uh, three or four things that you did when you were the CEO of Aetna that really drove that uh, performance chart? Yeah, I think one of the things that we did was um, we did uh, enormous focus on customer segmentation, of figuring out the, uh, what healthcare had historically been a B2B business where you sold to businesses. And we created a model which was a general manager model where the general manager was responsible in combination with a team, he had an actuary, she had an underwriter, medical director, sales team, a geography, and a customer segment. And their job was to draw on all the resources of the organization to figure out how to compete and win market share in that geography. That was one issue with structure and a model and alignment incentives. The other thing that we did was we invested very heavily in IT, uh, infrastructure and capability and completely updated and remodernized and recognized that information and integration of the data and what we think of now as building algorithms was what we did to predict high risk cases and patients with chronic conditions, diabetes, hypertension, and be able to, uh, to help those patients get regular medication and, and, and be compliant. So data and information was another critical element of what we did. The third was really culture. We, we hammered away at culture. And, and you know one of the points I would make about culture, culture is not what the CEO thinks it is. Culture is what employees tell you it is. <laughs> and if you are being successful in your culture, there is alignment between what the CEO thinks it is and what any new employee who walks in and asks somebody, how does it really work around here? If they get the same message, then it's mission accomplished. Thanks, uh, let's take the lady uh, on near the aisle, thank you. Hello, oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you Mr. Williams for your time. I wanted to ask you about mental health in, in the firms. Uh, how do you think corporate leaders can promote uh, mental health in the workplace, and how do you think that would impact the company in general? Thank you. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think that somewhere along the way, we separated be mental health and behavioral health from medical health. And I can tell you, if someone has had a heart attack or a stroke, and they're in rehabilitation, that person is most likely going to be depressed because they've lost enormous functionality. And to not treat them as a whole person is really an inadequate amount of care. So my belief is that it is important, and I think what employers can do is to make certain that services are available. Those services can range from something as simple as an employee assistance program where all someone needs is somebody to talk to for two or three sessions, and to help get them back on the right track all the way through you know, much more extensive behavioral interventions. But it is part of health, it's not something different. Some of it's organic, some of it isn't, it's behavioral, but I think we have to look at it holistically and treat everyone. Would, would, it, be, <coughs> would it be fair to say some companies are uh, very skittish on this issue because the predictability of uh, 
the, the cost associated with being really open uh, to mental health uh, interventions is uh, almost unlimited, less easily predicted than in the case of physical ailments. I mean, I think that's true, but you'll find, my experience is, and I'm certainly, I'm, I'm not a physician, I don't, I don't play one, but I've been hanging out in this area a long time, is very few people want to volunteer to go get behavioral health. I mean, it is not on most people's list. Most people need it and actually have to be coached and counseled. And quite honestly, the delivery models don't have to be expensive models. Uh, getting people together in groups with a skilled facilitator can provide a lot of help and support to people in a very low cost way. So I think, I think, like most problems, if you own the problem and you begin to think about how would you solve it to produce the best quality at the lowest cost, it takes you to a different place. Um, maybe the gentleman sitting next to the last question. Hello, thank you. Oh, well, I just want to, I saw that you were on the board for Envision as well, and I wanted to know your thoughts on uh, consolidation in the healthcare um, markets and what that, what that, what the implications of that would be for healthcare costs and delivery and what that means for the average American. Yeah. Well, consolidation is going on in lots of different ways in healthcare. And I am on the board, I was on the board of, of Envision, but a company like United How Health, United has 30,000 primary care physicians that they, that are part of their company. They just acquired another company or in the process of acquiring a company called Health Partners, there'll be almost 50,000 physicians in United Health. Um, other hospital systems are acquiring physician practices. The day of the individual physician who practices solo or one or two or three is rapidly diminishing because of the capital required, the electronic medical records, et cetera. The answer to your question is, it's not clear what the winning model is. Uh, Envision represents a slice of the emergency room and hospital-based physicians aggregating under kind of a corporate infrastructure that supports them. One of the businesses I chair, Agilon, focuses on primary care physicians. We do 20-year partnerships with uh, one of our physician groups has 300 primary care physicians. And we do a 20-year partnership where we bring the technology, the people, the process, the human capital, and the financial capital to help turbocharge their delivery of high quality care. It's not clear who's gonna win, but I think we're gonna see lots of different models, and over a five or six year period, we'll begin to see a distillation down to what models seem to be working. How has the work of a board member changed over the, let's say, 10, 15 years that you've been uh, an independent director? Well, I would say that the, probably one of the biggest changes was the recession. I mean, that was, particularly for financial services institutions, um, for those of you who were not you know, active in the business community on that chart, I mean, the bottom fell out of the world and a lot of companies were deeply worried about were they gonna make it through the other end. So that was a really big change and caused companies to focus much more on capital. Strategy became a much more short-term issue as that's receded, now the biggest issue is companies have infused technology, cyber, mobile, digital into the essence of who they are. These are not things that are left to IT or left to an element of the digital guru in the business. The board's expected to understand, be thoughtful, and be able to contribute to the strategic issues uh, that you see. Um, in front row. Hold on a minute, just we're gonna. We get information in the press about why um, certain people think it's difficult for women to get onto boards, and there's certainly an effort behind that now. I just wondered if you could give kind of an insider's opinion or maybe some insight into why is it so hard to get more women onto boards? You know, I would start with the fact that the ideal board member who's recruited starts with this kind of hierarchy. The first one is a sitting CEO. So you know the numbers on that, <laughs> okay? The second one is a recently retired CEO. <laughs> the third one is someone who is president and chief operating officer, and I'll say the CEO seat is theirs to lose. <laughs> they just gotta deliver and keep doing what they're doing. Then you move into the CFO, 
then you move into the audit partners, um, and then you move into different specialties. Like Johnson & Johnson, we have quite a few women on our board, and we've got three, three boards. They are scientists who are physicians or PhDs, some of whom will probably win the Nobel Prize, who are very accomplished in their careers. And so when you talk about these large companies, I mean, the filter is the problem. And certainly, uh, what we have to do is create more people into the pipeline. So I think as we tackle more women in the C-suite, uh, more women in STEM, and we make certain that people are getting the exposure and moving through the seats that lead to these types of assignments, it becomes uh, important. I think the boards I'm on, when we have an opening, we, we look and recruit for women uh, and to make certain that we have the right gender balance uh, on the board and we look for other communities as, as well. But it's a long-term project and we're not gonna get there overnight. The big question is, are companies diligently working the issue and showing material progress? Do you think, uh, do you think companies in uh, Europe are suffering in terms of governance as a result of uh, quota requirements for women directors? You know, I, I, I make it a habit to never talk about things I don't know anything about. <laughs> and that is one of them. Uh, I tried. <laughs> uh, let's take, uh, yes indeed, yeah, please. Thank you. I love your comment about the public CEO versus the private CEO and how much life is better when you're on the private side versus the public side. Uh, love your perspective on the, what's happening in this world today in terms of the shrinking number of public companies, fewer and fewer companies going public through IPOs or, or wanting to stay private, or as in, you said in the Aetna and CBS, you're shrinking the availability of public stock, coupled with the 70 plus percent of the shareholders being institutions, seems to be more money chasing fewer companies. So how is this whole dynamic plays from your perspective? Love to hear your thoughts. Well, there, there, there are lots of, of, of points in there. I'll, I'll maybe tr try to cover a few. One of the implications of the institutional focus is that there is a name, address, and phone number of the CEO of BlackRock. He lives somewhere. And if you've got a particular issue that you want to bring to his attention, you can camp out in front of his house. And at some point, you're going to get attention, and they're going to going to listen to you. When, you. when stock was widely held, it had to be a much more important, cohesive kind of nationwide issue. So I think the pressure points on institutions, which then create pressure points on companies, can't represent a dynamic which is a result of that. That can be for the good. It can also not be for the good. It just depends on you know, what the issue is and what's your point of view. But it is a phenomenon that is, that is present. Uh, I think in terms of the uh, shrinking base of, of companies, uh, and, and we didn't talk much about this, but it is the short term versus the long term issue. Um, I'm doing a CEO Academy next week that's got 200, we'll have I think 50 CEOs from kind of the top 250 companies, and one of the central topics is long term versus short term, and the answer is both. <laughs> that you don't live long missing your numbers and saying hang on to the great strategy, and the company doesn't do well if you burn all of the fuel to hit the quarter or the year and you're not investing in R&D and you're not improving your competitive position. And so sometimes the CEO has to have the courage, and as I mentioned earlier, that dog at home, <laughs> because they're going to go in and tell Wall Street, we're not gonna deliver 15% this year or 12% this year. We're gonna focus on R&D, we're gonna have more modest growth, and we're gonna, we're gonna pursue our strategy, which we believe is the right strategy, which when we come out the other end, we'll do better. That's a very tough thing for some people to do. You really gotta have, it, have the intestinal fortitude to be ready to do that. Talking of which, you uh, used the word horrific in your presentation. Uh, without naming names, can you share the most horrific uh, boardroom scenario you were involved in and how was it resolved? Well, I would say that I tell people I keep secrets for a living. <laughs> and so it's not good to uh, repeat things. 
the, there are no secrets in the world, so uh, no one will ever hear anything untoward from me. So I respectfully decline. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> All right. One more. Two, two more, and then we'll finish. Thanks. Go ahead, Dan. Can you see if you can get the mic down here, please? You know, um, looking at all the rash of health care mergers that are going on um, and what Obamacare did to the health care industry, it was sort of seen as a, a negative for the companies and their shareholders, and yet you were a large proponent of it. So I'm, I'm curious uh, why you were such a large proponent of it and how your shareholders viewed that. Well, you know, if you're... The, 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 the best expression I heard is that if you're not at the table, you're on the table. <laughs> and what that means is if you're not part of the solution, the solution may destroy you. <laughs> so it's not like you've got a choice to do nothing or do something. Something's going to be done. And do you want to influence what is going to be done in a way that produces the best outcome. And if it produces the best outcome and all companies are on the same level playing field, then I'm willing to bet I'll win. And so this wasn't a, you know, altruistic, it happened to be the right thing to do, but it also was a matter, and our shareholders understood that if we weren't actively there. Now, quite honestly, I, I gave them a lot of advice what they didn't take, and I'll just briefly t t tell you, say, look, if you want to get this done, there are three ways. You can do A and B, you can do C and D, or you can do E and F. And they would say, well, I like A and F. And I would say, that is an incompatible solution. <laughs> that will explode in three years. And they say, well, I still like it. And so you have to, you influence it as much as you can. At the end of the day, more people got coverage, more people got insured. And there's plenty to fix, believe me. Uh, and um, that's kind of the answer to your question. Last one at the yeah. back. Just uh... You started off with uh, mentioning your book, and I appreciate that, highlighting that. So just two quick questions. What book are you currently reading, and what book made the most impact in your life? Well, there are two. Uh, the one I current, I just finished the, the Dean's book on healthcare. <laughs> And uh, actually, uh, it was really, uh, I found it quite enjoyable uh, reading because I think it, it really captured the dilemma that we face in healthcare migrating from this business to business to a business to consumer. And the question of are you a patient, are you a consumer, and there are different places where you are one or the other. So I, I, I really in, enjoyed um, that book. Uh, actually, the one I'm, I'm in the middle of, of, of reading now is uh, a book on long-term versus short-term uh, management, and it's, it's really about those inherent tensions and trade-offs, and it's also about the difference between new CEOs and mid-term CEOs, and by mid-term, you know, you come in, you're new, you, you have lots of energy, you're, you've got all that good news, you've got your dog put away, and th three and a half years later, <laughs> you look back and boy, it didn't quite work out the way you wanted. So you've got to run left, what do you do? Do you have the right team? Do you have the right strategies? Do you have the right processes? So that's, so those are a couple of books I'm uh, 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 reading right now. Ron, I want to thank you. Uh, I think you would all agree with me that uh, <laughs> Thanks, 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 I, I, I j just, just want to say, I mean, if every, if every non-executive and independent director in the United States uh, had this level of dedication, integrity, and skill, we would be all sleeping extremely well at night. Ron, thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you.